Thank you for joining us. I imagine at least some of you were at the Back to After party, so I am extremely impressed to see your faces. Um, I will ask two indulgences of you guys today. One is, pardon my husky voice, I went to bed at 4 a.m. Uh, the other one is, indulge us a little bit. This is somehow for you and for your edification, but it's also for us. I don't know the last time any of you saw two black women on stage at a tech conference, but I haven't seen it ever, so we're also going to enjoy this um, a little bit. So if we code switch, if we use terminology you don't understand, if we get into our giggles, just humor us and you can ask us later anything that we need to explain. <laughs> but I'm so excited for this. I am so thrilled, actually, that it's, it's you featuring in this conversation um, and I think in many ways you're obviously very different to your category as a founder you are not only in terms of your sex your gender your uh, you know your race what you're building and who you're building it for um, but also in how you're trying to build the company how you're trying to change the game radically even as you hopefully win it um, for yourself and then in many other ways you're very typical. You embody the founder traits that as investors we look for, and that's what I want to focus on today. Um, so let's, let's start with ambition, which is the sort of rather typical one that we look for. Venture is a scarcity game. You need people who will win and beat out the competition and be rare. Uh, where is that from? Where is, in, in you, where is that eat the world ambition coming from? Sure, that's a very good question. So. I grew up in London and I moved to London as a fetus because my, uh, my parents were living in Ghana and during the military coup things got a bit shaky so my dad was either being thrown into prison or shot at by soldiers okay. with my pregnant mum and my two older brothers in the back of the car. So he was like, I'm cutting out. He left Accra, he moved to London, my pregnant mum followed with me not long after. And I guess being born into adversity, it kind of does something to you, you know, you have to be quite resilient. Uh, I grew up in an area that was quite white and I was always the one who got picked on by the teachers because they knew my name. So if people were being naughty, it was Rachel. And I was such a goody two-shoes. But I got all these labels attached yeah. to me. And quite early on, I realized, OK, I can't just hide in the background as I want to do as an introvert. Uh, I have to really figure out yeah. how to marry up who I actually want to be with how I'm perceived. So that's been a lifelong journey. And then on a bigger scale, the Afro hair care market is a mess, right? Super fragmented. It's worth over $46 billion growing fast. Mm -hmm. There's over 3 billion people with Afro and curly hair. In fact, backstage, I was talking to the makeup artist. She's a Finn. Yes. Her hair was straight, but she was very interested in what I was spraying on my hair, Afrocentric sheen, of course, because she has naturally curly hair and she straightens it because she can't find any products. So this isn't just a black woman or a black man problem. This is a global problem where we can't find safe, effective products that make our hair look professional, attractive, manageable without risking our health. And that's just not right. So I have a strong drive to change that. Okay, so the ambition is made up of two parts. One is just the sort of stubbornness that comes from yes. being <laughs> visible. If you're gonna have to show up, if you have to work 10 times as hard to be taken half as seriously, then you have to commit. And on the other side, it's a problem worth solving and that drives you. All right, let's, you touched on resilience briefly, but I think this one comes up a lot. Somebody once described it to me as mountain goat-like stubbornness. <laughs> you just keep going. And um, I wonder if you can speak to that a little more deeply. What is that? What does resilience mean for you? What does grit mean for you? And what are some of the things that, you know, over your story have told you that you have that in spades? You have enough of that for the journey ahead? Sure. Okay. So... <sighs> I had a pretty rough childhood, right? So I've been in therapy for about 10 years dealing with CPTSD, so complex post-traumatic 
stress disorder. Mm. So I, I get a lot of anxiety and then I have to do stuff like this and, you know, be on stages and constantly show up. Yeah. So as the CEO, as the leader, people are looking to me. So I try to be very honest about the fact that, you know, I have these mental health challenges. They're not my fault. My, my childhood was pretty rough, right? Uh, but it teaches you that, okay, if I've overcome that, I can deal with yeah. a bad VC call, right? <laughs> and... Um, I think there's also being underestimated as a founder. You have to constantly overcome people's perceptions of you, yeah. people's assumptions, and people's prejudices. So I was 19 when I started Afrocentric, so I was young. I don't look like Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, I have a hidden disability. So I have dyspraxia, which is a motor coordination disorder. People don't generally understand it. It means I'm constantly bumping into things, bruising myself. I get lost all the time. I'm late all the time. Uh, when I met with Daisy yesterday, I managed to drop a chair on my foot. So there's a large bruise on my foot. And it's stuff like that all the time that just makes navigating the world tricky. But then I'm like, I'm proud of myself. I got to the VC yeah. meeting without getting lost. There so there's nothing they can say that's going to shake me. You know, yeah. you have to develop it over the way. That is true. I think something that probably also helps is there's like a cultural resilience that happens too. Because even yes. if you personally haven't been through something, you know someone who has. Mm. Because as a community, as black people, as black women especially, you share these stories. Yeah. And so you're like, well, there's Nigerians would say it didn't kill her, so it probably won't kill me. Yeah. So um, I think that makes a lot of difference. I think the third thing that certainly we look for when we say that we're um, trying to find exceptional founders is sort of this problem-seeking behavior. It's not just problem-solving. It's not just that you deal with things when, you, when they come at you. It's this tendency, almost compulsion, to go looking for trouble, as it were, um, meaning that you more likely than not proactively find it um, and you get your own little kick out of solving it. Where is, where is that from? Because there are lots of people who go through things. There are lots of people who have resilience, and that just means that if it comes at them, they'll survive. That's not the same thing as, I'm going to go fix it, me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's funny is my therapist describes me as very dutiful. <laughs> so I'm not someone who's actually interested in leading. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not super, super impressed when someone's like, oh, I've led this. I'm probably more impressed by builders, right? Yeah. And now as I've been a leader for 11 years, I'm more impressed by leaders because there's a lot of stress on our shoulders. But it wasn't something I sought out. Yeah. So Afrocentric started when my friend Joycelyn and I met at university. I was studying law. She was studying sociology. I came from a place where there were no black people up in Harrow in northwest London. She grew up in Hackney, East London. Lots of black people. So we got to uni and I was like, there's so many black people. This is great. And she's like, where are all the black people? This <laughs> yeah. is very white. I remember the first time I was in London, I was like, it, they're everywhere. Yeah. Like, I'm not allowed to say that, but it's true. There's so many. <laughs> can buy plantain in like the high street. It's amazing. So... We came from these two different angles, but we had shared problems. We both had bold patches when we were kids, which is wild, right? Yeah. Shouldn't happen. Because our, our mums had used relaxers to straighten our hair. Yeah. Uh, for those who are into chemistry, the active ingredient in a relaxer is sodium hydroxide caustic soda, it's incredibly alkaline, it's the same active ingredient in drain unblocker, but at least and oven cleaner, hair straight, it gets your hair look straight. More European. And they sell it in boxes called Kitty Perm for kids, you never look like the little girl in the box, because her hair's not relaxed, <laughs> it's just straightened. So anyway, we both had these bold patches caused by chemical alopecia, traction alopecia, and I also have very bad eczema, you can kind of see it on my hands, that's why my hands look older than my grandmother's, and she's 91. Uh, and that meant I had a lot of problems I had to solve. Yeah. So it started because we were just solving our own problems. Yes. And I'm a bit of a chemistry nerd. So we went to the library. We read cosmetic science journals. We bought beakers and pipettes and Petri dishes, set up a little lab in my university hall's kitchen. And we just started making stuff. And I, I like remember writing formulations down on graph paper. I had left over from my maths A-levels, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was studying law. This was, I was in humanities and I was, my head was still, my heart was still in science. And... In solving that problem, especially remembering that me and Joycelyn came from different perspectives, we're, incre we're like chalk and cheese, so, so different. So we realized, you know, we don't understand the black experience or the Afro and curly hair experience because we're not a monolith. As I said, over three billion people worldwide have Afro and curly hair, and you can't assume you know them all. So we became obsessive over data, right? We went on Mintel. Mintel... 
their black hair care report, which was world leading, had 31 <laughs> respondents. Their sample size was 31 people, and they were actually trying to say this could tell you anything. Even in Finland, you can walk around and find 31 black people on the street. Honestly, I've seen 31 today. So what we did is we went to the Afro Hair and Beauty show, which we couldn't afford tickets yeah. for, stood outside with a clipboard. If you have a clipboard, people will answer your questions. You look serious. You have a high vis, you so, can get into anywhere. Literally. So had our clipboards, had our own survey with the Mintel questions and more, and we got 100 respondents in a day, and we're like, yes, we beat Mintel, right? So we're feeling super psyched. And since then, actually, we've gone on to beat Mintel. So now they're a bit better. They've got about 900 respondents. Okay. Um, my research, which is ongoing just through the website, through our quiz, we've got over 17,000 respondents okay. so far without pushing it, no budget. So I think we're People doing... People are excited really to answer well. these questions. Like, I had the same thing. They're like, Basically understand me. Here. I'm yeah. like, solve my problems. If you want to ask me questions so you can help, I'm happy to give that information it's not difficult exactly just so, has to care. So, exactly so in terms of the on a surface level what we do those problems kind of came to me yeah. I, I had those problems but underneath if you look at the base of the iceberg problems of ethics of sustainability of you know your your ESG kind of narratives and approach those problems I had to seek out. I had to think, okay, so why are there so many toxic chemicals in our products that are being dumped into our waterways, damaging aquatic life, and what can we do to make yeah. that different? So I it's a know. journey, but I'm quite it's, proud of what we've done. I think it checks out. I think if you, if you from an extremely young age are used to just being faced with bizarre circumstances, why does this specific teacher seem to pick on me? Why does yeah. this person talk to me like this? Why do I have to make my hair do this thing and sit for hours on a Sunday when I could just leave it run wild. I think at some point you develop a certain appetite just for the satisfaction that comes from a problem well solved. Exactly. Um, but I think it's fantastic because it means that not only can I look forward, like continue to enjoy healthy hair, I can continue to enjoy being, rep like enjoy a brand that represents all of me, the way I want to see the world shape. I don't have to wake up in five years and be like, great hair care products, terrible about the fish they murdered with their chemicals. Exactly. And it's, that's, that's a really exciting time. Um, I think in terms of traits, the other element then, if we say we have ambition squared away, we have resilience and grit, and then we've also got this problem-seeking behavior, the other ingredient then is, you know, a problem worth solving, because that's the magic. What is the thing that so, you know, widely and deeply affects people that you can know that your effort is validated by reducing some suffering in the world. So why, like you've touched on it variously, but why is this a problem? What's worth solving? What are some of those stories that bring it home? Why does hair matter so much is a question someone has asked me once before. I would love for you to It's a great question. That. <laughs> okay, so I don't need to explain this to my customers, but I've gotten very used to explaining it yeah. to bold white men in pictures. <laughs> And I, I typically put it this way. So we're not in the beauty industry. We're seen as being in the beauty industry. I see it as we're in the health and well-being industry, and I've always seen it that way. So I care deeply about health and well-being. And when people... So when I built our first website, I literally yeah. learned to code on MySpace and Neopets, giving away my age here. And I built this really basic website, and I just put the research I'd found out there, I put the results of our research, and I was getting emails on my very basic Tumblr blog yeah. <laughs> from people all around the world, right? And this woman who worked in a mortuary in America got in touch, and she said she was doing a post-mortem on an African-American woman. She'd passed away, I think, uh, it was heart failure, quite young, so in her 50s. And there was scarring on her brain. And this, this you know, <laughs> black kind of trainee doctor said, well, what's going on? It was her heart that failed. Why does her brain look like this? And the, <laughs> the white doctor, the senior doctor who was teaching her, he said, oh, it's common with African-American women. It's all those chemicals you put on your hair. Can you imagine, like, we... we are putting things on our hair that are causing scarring on our skulls and yeah. brains? Mm -hmm. Like, how disturbing is that? The people and why are we low. doing that? Yeah. So the question is, why are we doing that? So I think the fact that people do that shows there's a problem, right? 
and it shows the solution isn't very good. So how I typically put it to the bold white men I'm often pitching to mm-hmm. is imagine you had to be clean shaven for work. So beards are not an option, it's not acceptable. And every time you shave, you get razor bumps, you get a rash, your beard will hurt, it will look red and inflamed, it will look awful and everyone's staring at it. And on top of that, it hurts, you're in pain, you can't sleep properly, you feel insecure, you feel like you can't be in that space. Yeah. What would you want? You would want someone to solve that problem. You would want someone to make good tools, yeah. to make good products, to make sure you don't have to go through that experience, and also to like normalize stubble, right? And that's what we do at Afrocentric. So if you want to have this sleek, kind of straightened look, you can do that with our products. Yeah. If you want to wear your hair like you know naturally how it grows from your scalp, you can do that with our products. And you can do that knowing that if you've got eczema, if you've got psoriasis, yeah. you're going to be fine. Even if you don't have skin conditions, you won't develop one because of our products, because we don't don't use the common allergens, we don't use anything that would harm people or planet at all, yeah. and we go out of our way to make sure the products are safe and effective. Yeah. So we're solving this problem. Our customers are frequently telling us how we've changed their lives, and it's one thing that helps me to persevere, because at the moment, running a product business, it's not fun, guys. Global supply chains are a mess. I'm constantly under stress. The whole team is overly stretched. And what keeps us going is we speak to customers every day. We get that feedback. We get the mum, like a white mum of mixed race kids, saying my daughter has hated her hair her whole life. I've told her it's beautiful. Then she saw your Christmas ad on television. We got some products. Her hair's softer than it's ever been, and she loves her hair, and she's, she's walking with her hair tail tie. We get doctors who tell us they've gone 30 years, and and this is literally three women in the last year, who all happen to be doctors who've been going to work with wigs for the last 20 to 30 years of their career. I dated a guy for three months and he only ever saw me in a wig. Literally. Honestly. I sleep with it, I woke up with it, I was like, what what am I going to do? Show him this? This? Exactly, and they said that switching to Afrocentrics, yeah. learning to you know, love their hair, to care for their hair, it's just, it's helped them to bring their authentic self yeah. to work. It's helped them feel like they are acceptable. Because if you feel like your hair is unacceptable or your skin is unacceptable, by extension, you feel like you're unacceptable. Yeah. You're not allowed in that space. So this is why I say we are in the business of health and well-being. It's yeah. about showing people you matter to So we're going to make products for you. It might be that the whole industry doesn't care about you. You know, we just had the first ever British Christmas advert for Afro hair ever in 2021. Can we we accept how mad that is? So thank you. So I'm proud of the milestone, but that shouldn't be a milestone, milestone. right? (laughs) Why? When beauty companies are making so much money from us, 46 billion, Why are we not represented on TV? You know, what message is that sending to people who look like us? It's telling us that we don't matter, we're irrelevant in the narrative, even though Afro hair care products outperform every category. So there's there's a lot to do. Exactly. And it's so interesting because I think sometimes when we talk about this, it seems exceedingly dramatic. You know, there are a few people who would say that the most important problem you could solve is, you know, black hair care, but... Self-confidence is a hell of a thing, but yeah. the absence of it is also yeah. a hell of a thing. And the standards you hold yourself to when there is no indication <laughs> that you are enough as you are, yeah. whether you don't get a job and it's partly because you didn't present yourself well or you don't get into that school and it's because you strayed too far from the norm, it matters whether yeah. or not you think you are seen by the world as you want to. Like, I think I look great today. I think you look great today. Thank you. You asked me 15 years ago how I felt about my skin, my hair, any of these things. I would have said that they were active anchors. They were ball bearers that just meant that I, was, I wasn't going to get very far. It didn't matter how smart I was and it didn't matter all the ideas I had. People would see me and decide that this packaging is an ideal. And so to have a company that not only tries to solve for that, but tries to change the narrative around that is a thing I'm very grateful to see in my lifetime. Thank you. Thanks for being a customer. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, as the saying goes, hair isn't everything, but it's a great place to start. I think the other part that's really interesting, and we started, you know, with this, um, is Of course, you're very typical of the founder set. Of course, you're trying to build a great company and you are full of all the characteristics we look for, but you are trying to do things very differently. Apart from what you're building, how you are, this this unwillingness, I guess, 
to just win for yourself no. or your employees on your own terms, but also to be part of changing what it means to build a business, to be part of changing what it means to play the capitalist game, which is a little bit ridiculous because you're already, <laughs> you already have your work cut out for you just trying to win the game. Why take on this additional burden? Why take on that risk? And what are some of the things that that, yeah. that means for your day to day? So, uh, to be honest, I didn't choose to take on the burden. I'm exhausted <laughs> when it comes to conversations about race and ethnicity. I don't want to talk about it, and but my, my complexion <laughs> invites these conversations. So I had like three of them on the way to Helsinki that I did not start, right? Everyone's talking about Black Lives Matter, about race. I'm tired of it, but I need to engage because the burden is placed on me. So either it weighs me down and I'm crushed by it, or I lift it up and I'm like, we're going to make this smaller. We're going to minimize it and we're going to share it. So when it comes to to the work I do in the startup community, I'm constantly learning things, I write these medium articles, push it out there, so other people don't have to struggle in the way I have. Like, one person's struggle is enough, let's make it easier for everyone else. And, and one thing that I'm proud of, but equally horrified by, is the fact that uh, we were the, the ninth black woman-owned startup to raise VC capital in the last decade. So we're talking 10 years. Only nine. Nine. <laughs> Black women. Nine. <laughs> we're, like, we're thank you. So, investing it. So that's not even one a year, right? That, that's awful. And, and since then, what, what I'm elated by is there've been like five. Yes. Right? So the change is exponential. Yeah. And back to gone a great way. You've, you've backed us, of course, which I'm very happy about. And you've backed at least two other black female founders yeah. I know of. Went from 0% when I started to 7.6% of the portfolio of black women. And well done, Daisy. Great work. <laughs> but it's true. But what's wild is, so of these black founders who've, who, who've raised investment, they are just like unnecessarily exceptional, <laughs> right? So I feel quite average compared to a lot of them. And two of us on your portfolio are both in Mensa, right? <laughs> so why do we have to be in the top one to 2% of, of global IQ schools to raise investment? Does that make sense? Because I have a lot of friends who are white male founders and many of them are exceptional and Probably more of them would say by their own admission that they're not, that they're pretty average, but they care about the problem they're solving and they're uniquely placed to solve it. Yeah. I meet so many black women who even just to get to like the pre-seed stage, just to get a bit of angel investment, they've had to be world class. Well, you have to play right? three-dimensional chess with everything. Everything yeah. from that. And I think, you know, the women in this audience will understand and anyone who's ever been an outsider will understand this. When you engage with someone and you're constantly trying to figure out what is it that they're seeing? Are they hearing what I'm yeah. saying? Do I have to translate this particular you part? Do. You always do I have, have to, to prove this? You always do. And yeah. so the sheer amount of computation that is happening in a day-to-day -day basis it's in my brain. Soon. Yeah. Astonishing. I remember once some, reading something and it said, what would I have accomplished if I, if I could devote even a fraction of my capacity to solving problems that matter yeah. rather than trying to figure out how to navigate the world exactly. in a way that I'll be seen as I am. Exactly, because race is a distraction from like actual <laughs> yeah. problems we want. It's a made up category that didn't exist before the 16th century. You know, ethnicity is yeah. real. Um, you know, genetic and phenotypical differences very much real. Yes. But these weird racial classifications, they're just silly. Like my kids look Korean or something. Like yeah. we're, we're also so mixed up when we actually look at our DNA and it, it's there's something about that human tapestry of yes. differences that's so beautiful but going back to, to the differences that between what I faced and what some of my kind of white male counterparts have faced fundraising sucks for everybody and VCs like back to make it suck a little bit less but it still sucks right lots of due diligence lots of hoops to jump through lots of pitches and everyone has to deal with, you know, doing in one day about 15 VC pitches and being told you're both too early and too late by seed stage investors. Everyone has to deal with that, right? It sucks whoever you are. You can be an able-bodied, straight white man from a middle-class background that went it to Oxford, sucks. and it's still difficult. But what they don't have to deal with that I didn't realize was a problem till it was pointed out to me is people telling you that uh, when you ask, you know, so what's your thesis uh, and what can you bring to the table? Because it has to be win-win. It's a two-way relationship. They don't get told stuff like, well, you guys need some adult supervision. 
that's not something any of my white male friends have ever been told. And I didn't realize how bad it was until my husband, who's white and a man, uh, was horrified. And he was really upset that that was said to yeah. me. Uh, they don't reach a final partner pitch after dealing with lots of associates <laughs> and, get, and get asked, what is it you do again? Is it some kind of bolding solution? And then get told, well, this doesn't really make sense because yeah. uh, like, black people don't have that much money. Why are, you focused, why are you looking at Africa? There's no money in Africa. The stupidity <laughs> and the levels of ignorance that I have to deal with. Yeah. Um, I, I, and the, I think and one it's of the coded also, so you don't even know that that's what's happening. It's not as though you're in a boxing ring, somebody throws a punch. Yeah. You know that you're being punched, so yeah. you can duck. And, and you, you wonder, like, is, it is, is it me? Did I miss something? Am I an idiot? Do so, I not understand my own company? So I'll just Maybe. tell two brief stories, right? So I had one VC pitch, and I was driving while I was doing it, which wasn't the best idea, but I've got two young children. My schedule's packed. And to wrap up on this, by the way. <laughs> I love chatting with you, but apparently we are grossly over time. Oh, gosh, I haven't once oh, that thing. I can't tell my two stories. But in very, very brief, I had an investor kind of grill me and ask me questions that didn't make sense. Yeah. I answered one of the questions and he's like, well, I know that. I'm not stupid. And I thought, so why are you asking me? Do you think I'm stupid? Why are you taking pictures from people who you think are stupid? Yeah. And you're constantly dealing with that or things where people in the group chat afterwards are horrified and they apologize to you and you're like, but that wasn't that bad. <laughs> and the VCs are apologizing to me. So it's a minefield, but I, I trust it's getting better. And I think all of the people here here we are, are. going to be part of that change. There we go. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.